Okay, and we begin our study of First Thessalonians this morning. Now, for a, a part of the class, I'm not sure how much, what, how great of a part. Uh, let me get my clicker. But I will be doing uh, introducing the book. Now, as I've said many times, probably every time I begin a book, when I talk about introduction, I tell you that the introduction is not filler. I wouldn't do that to you. You see, rather, it's, uh, it provides context for the writing, which is very important in interpreting the writing. The letters of the New Testament, they are what's known as occasional documents, meaning they're written to specific groups of Christians in specific situations and circumstances. So in one sense, we are reading someone else's mail. You see, there's a very real sense that we're reading somebody else's mail. Now, of course, these letters, like all Scripture, they ultimately are intended for the teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness of God's people. But to hear that message correctly to God's people, we first have to hear correctly the message that was given to the original audience. And once we've heard that correctly, we're then in a position to understand what is God saying to us today through what he originally said to the Thessalonians. So that's why it's important to have some of the, the context. See, we, we, it's important for us to do that, to hear the original, hear it, what he's saying to the original readers. Now, introductory information, it helps us in that regard. It helps us to hear what Paul is saying to the Thessalonians. And it does that by filling in some context. You see, when you're reading somebody else's mail, it's something like hearing one side of a conversation. We have what he wrote to them, but it helps us to understand what he's saying if we know something about the situation. Something, if you're listening to one side of a conversation, if you know what's going on in the context, it helps you understand what is he saying in his part. So that's why introduction stuff is important. In addition, I think it's just, uh, it's interesting to me. And it's fascinating. So let me begin with a reminder for you just of a probable partial chronology of Paul's life. Now these things, they're fairly precise, but you may be able to move a year one way or the other. You know, some of these things, are, but these are fairly precise. And we have Paul's conversion around 33 or 34. And then we have the three years that he spent in Damascus and Arabia. So that's from, say, 33, 34 to 36, 37. Then you have the first Jerusalem visit. That's in 36 or 37. And then we have that interesting time of roughly eight years where Paul is in Tarsus in Cilicia, about which we know almost nothing. So he's there for eight years, and then, then Barnabas calls him to Antioch, and that's around 43 to 45, sometime in there. And then we have the second Jerusalem visit, which is the famine visit. That's reported there in Acts chapter 11. That's like 46 or 47. And then you have the first missionary journey, which he takes with Barnabas, and that's in Acts 13 and 14. And I don't know if this is big enough to see, but you'll recall the missionary journey where they come down, Paul and Barnabas, and they go to Cyprus, and they go up here into this region here, the southern Galatia here, and they plant churches, and then they return they go back to Antioch. And so that's his first missionary journey. And then when he returns there, Galatians is probably written. There's some debate about whether it's written to northern Galatia or southern Galatia. I think it makes more sense. Southern Galatia, those churches that he was doing there uh, in that first missionary journey. And he writes that around 48 or 49. And then we have the Jerusalem Council. You know, this is this council about how are we going to handle Gentiles. And that's in, reported in Acts 15. And then we get the second missionary journey, which is in Acts 15 to 18, where it probably runs from 49 to 51. 
All right, so you have a sense of Paul's chronology, his life, what's going on. And I want to spend some time talking about the second missionary journey. After that Jerusalem council in A.D. 49, Paul suggests that he and Barnabas, that they go back to the churches that they had planted. And he wants to go back and encourage them and build them and that kind of thing. And they disagreed over taking John Mark. You remember John Mark on the first missionary journey, he had deserted them early in that journey. And Paul thought that was a, a, a negative strike. He didn't like that. And so he, they disagreed over taking him. And so Barnabas takes John Mark and he goes down to Cyprus. You remember on the first journey, they went here to Cyprus. So Barnabas takes John Mark down here. But Paul and Silas, they go, and all of this is on foot, of course. <laughs> you see, so, you know, it's like going through the Taurus Mountains and all this stuff. And so they're going to go on foot over through here to the churches that Paul and Barnabas in their first missionary journey that they had, that they had planted. Now, when they visited Lystra, a town, in, a town in modern Turkey, they were joined there. This is, they go out here and they, they come. And I, I don't know if you probably can't see the names here, but here's Lystra. And so they had visited that, that city on their first missionary journey. When Paul and Silas visited, it's in modern Turkey, they're joined there by a young Christian named Timothy. And Paul and Barnabas, as I said, in the first missionary journey, they had been there in Lystra some two years earlier. And at that time, Timothy's mother, Eunice, and his grandmother, Lois, they probably became Christians during that visit. And I say that, it's just an inference, but in 2 Timothy 1.5, it says that faith dwelt in them first. And so I think the mother and the grandmother are converted to Christ during that visit. And when Paul returns to Lystra during his second missionary journey with Silas, Timothy's a Christian. And he has a good reputation not only with the brothers in Lystra, but also in the adjoining town of Iconium. So it's not surprising that Paul wants to take him on the journey. So here he's with Silas. They come to Lystra. Paul is, he sees Timothy there. Timothy's a faithful Christian. Paul says, I want to take him with us. Now, as I say, he, he, Timothy most likely became a Christian through the influence of his mother and the church elders in Lystra. And Paul had a clear connection with that because if Paul on his first journey converts his mother, converts his grandmother, converts the people who are elders, appoints the elders, I mean, Paul's deep into this. But if I'm reading this correctly, Paul is not the direct person who led Timothy to Christ. He has a clear but indirect hand in Timothy's conversion, which along with the working relationship that Paul developed with Timothy, that led him some years later to refer to Timothy as his true child in the faith. So he's connected to Timothy's conversion intimately, and he works with him for a long time. So Paul and Timothy have a really close bond. Now they went from town to town here in southern Galatia. They go from town to town delivering the decision of the Jerusalem council. You remember in Acts 15 that we have that council. They make this decision and they're taking it and delivering that and they're strengthening the churches. And you see that in Acts 16 verses 4 and 5. And then the Spirit guided them to Troas by preventing them from speaking in the Roman province of Asia. Okay, so here they are. The Spirit leads them over to Troas. And he does that by preventing them from speaking here and from going into Bithynia. So he kind of funnels them over to Troas. Now, we'd like to know how did the Spirit prevent them? We're not told. Did the Spirit say to them, don't go there? Were there other things that were put up as obstacles that Paul could recognize were the Spirit's work instead of Satan's work? But he winds up, they wind up, uh, the Spirit guides them there, preventing them from speaking the, the word in that Roman province, which is the western part of Asia Minor, and from going in Bithynia. You see that in Acts 16, 6 to 8. 
And then in Troas, when they get to Troas, having been brought there by the Spirit, Paul's given a vision of a man from the Roman province of Macedonia. Now you see here we're getting over to Europe. And you see here is this Roman province of Macedonia. Paul is in Troas and he's given a vision of this, of this man from that province calling to him to come over to Macedonia to help them. So Paul immediately, they're, they're, they promptly sail then from Macedonia in response to that vision. So Paul knows this is a vision of God, I'm being called to go there. And they sail and they go to the island of Samothrace, and then they go to the city of Neapolis, and then they go to Philippi, all in Macedonia. And Philippi is a leading city in the province. And that's where you remember that Paul and Silas, they wind up being severely beaten and thrown in prison, right? Even though they were Roman citizens, which made that treatment of them illegal. But you, I just want you to try to get into the life of what's going on. Paul walks this way. Paul is driven. He is called by God to go and tell a dying and lost world what God has done in Jesus. And he goes here and he's going. He goes to Troas. He gets called over there and he's beaten. Now you think about that. You, you would think, God, didn't you just tell me to come over here? Didn't you just, and, and the answer is yes, he did. It was a vision to come over there. And yet, what happened? Paul is beaten and he's imprisoned illegally. And then from Philippi, Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Oh, I also wanted to point out to you that when, the, when they sail from Macedonia, this is the first, by the way, of, of what are called the we passages in Acts. There are, I think, five. And by that, I mean... They, Luke, who writes Acts, he starts there referring to we. And there are times, those five passages, where it's, it's apparent that Luke is in their company. And so I think that's worth pointing out. All right, from Philipp, Philippi, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they went to, to Thessalonica. And it's about a, it's about a four-day four walk. Uh, if their pace is, isn't slowed by the beating they received. So if you're walking normally, it's going to take you about four days. But they've been beaten severely and thrown in prison, so it's hard to know how long it would have taken them. They plant the church in Thessalonica. Let's see if I can spot it up here, right here. You see, so they were in Philippi. They take a beating. They come down to Thessalonica, and they preach there, and they plant the church. And that's the church that Paul's going to write to, that we're, the letters we're going to be studying. He's going to write back to this church that he plants there in Thessalonica. And after starting that church, you know what happened? They're forced to flee, right? They're forced to flee to Berea because the Jews started a riot in the city. So here they're here. They plant the church. The Jews start a riot and they're forced to flee over here to Berea. So he's beaten and imprisoned in Philippi. He's chased out of Thessalonica when a riot starts. He goes down to Berea, and you see much the same thing winds up happening in Berea. So they start that, they flee, and we don't really know how long Paul was in Thessalonica. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, how long are they there? We don't know that for sure. It says in Acts 17, 2, that Paul reasoned in the synagogue for three Sabbath days, but that probably was the time he spent specifically among the Jews after which he preached to the Gentiles. Okay, so certainly he was there the three Sabbath days reasoning in the synagogues. But that need not mean that that's the only time he spent there. And the fact that he worked at his trade while he was in Thessalonica, as you see in, in 1 Thessalonians 2, 7-9, the fact he received aid from the Philippians while he was in Thessalonica, perhaps on more than one occasion, you see in Philippians 4.16, and he apparently appointed church leaders in Thessalonica, as suggested by 1 Thessalonians 5.12. Well, that suggests that his stay was longer than three weeks. Now, how much longer? Well, we don't really know how much longer. 
At most, he was there a matter of months. Okay, Luke certainly doesn't portray his time in Thessalonica as being lengthy. And we know from an ancient in- inscription that a man named Gallio, that he was appointed and he served as pro of Achaia, which is a political office. So he serves as pro of Achaia from July of 51 to July of 52. Now this is one of the important anchor points in doing a chronology of Paul's life because we have this inscription and that we then work around it. So we have, well, he did this for this long, so that's a, that gives us an absolute date. And so Gallio is there from July 51 to 52, and Paul's stay in Corinth of over a year and a half, it ends not long after he appeared before Gallio. And so it looks like he, he probably arrived in Corinth in early 50. And he came before Gallio in the late summer of 51, and he left for Antioch in the fall of 51. And so for Paul to be in Corinth in early 50, it doesn't leave too many months for him to stay in Thessalonica. Okay, so it looks like he's there, I would say he's there more than three weeks, but he's not there many months. So it's a short, relatively short visit. Now, his experience in Berea, as I said, it was similar to his experience in Thessalonica. He's essentially run out of Thessalonica when the Jews come here and he's sent away. And his Jewish opponents from Thessalonica, now, just look at his life. You know, he's all of this. He's serving the living God. And the way some people think today is that that means that God will put a bubble over him and he will have no hardship in his life. And I always say, pull what little hair I have out and say, how can you possibly be reading the Bible? Why would you think that? And so he goes down to Berea. They follow him there. They stir up the crowds against him. So the brothers then, they send him off to Athens. They send him to Athens and they leave Silas and Timothy in Berea. And then Silas and Timothy, they then join Paul. He's over here. He's then in Athens. They left Silas and Timothy in Berea. Silas and Timothy later join Paul in Athens. And then Timothy is sent back to Thessalonica. Okay, Paul wants to know what's going on. You understand that people weren't able to be in communication. It's not like the world we grew up in where you could either call or do this or somebody's got a paper they're doing. It It wasn't that way. So when you're away from somebody and they've been away for a while, Paul wants to know what is going on and what has happened with this infant church that we've planted and that we were driven out from. So he's very interested. So he sends, he sends Timothy uh, to, back to Thessalonica, and Silas is sent to some undisclosed place in Macedonia. And then he and Timothy, perhaps with Silas returning first, but he and Timothy, uh, they then rejoin Paul, who in the meantime had moved from Athens to Corinth. So when they rejoin Paul, th- Paul's now in Corinth, And Paul's condition when he arrived in Corinth, it's reflected in what he wrote to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3. He says, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. You see, we always think, no, 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 that's not a Christian. You know, the Christian, no, Paul's getting beaten and harassed and everybody hates him and they're after him. You know, I don't mean everybody. Obviously, the Christians love him. But you see all, all that Paul is facing here in doing this. And so they come back, and so he's there. He stay, I mentioned he stays in Corinth for over a year and a half. And that's where, that's where he is when, when Timothy and Silas return to him. And the, the news that Timothy brought Paul about the situation in Thessalonica, that's what prompts Paul to write 1 Thessalonians. Okay, so here's what Paul's gone through. Here's the setup here. He sends Timothy back. Timothy now comes to him in Corinth. And the news he brings 
is what prompts the writing of 1 Thessalonians. You can see that in 1 Thessalonians 3, 6 to 8. So the letter's written from Corinth, because that's where Paul is when Timothy and Silas join him. It's most likely then it's written around A.D. 50. So this is when it's being written in Corinth after he's re received news about the Thessalonian situation. Now both, both 1st and 2nd th Thessalonians, they identify Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. They identify them in the salutation. Okay, you know how every, every culture has a letter writing style. Like if I started said to you, dear John, you'd know, okay, he's writing a letter. All right, well, this is how ancient world had a, a way of writing a letter, and it begins with a salutation, who's the letter from? Okay, so both First and Second Thessalonians have Paul, uh, Silas, Silvanus, and Timothy in the salutation. Now, it's clear from comparing Paul's letters to the book of Acts that Silvanus is Silas, right? They're the, they're the same person. Silas was a Jewish name. And so he presumably then, he, had a, he, he adopted a similar sounding Roman name. Okay, that's a, if your name sounds odd in a culture, well then you just take a variation of it that sounds like a Roman name. And so Silas is Silvanus, and according to Acts 15.22 and Acts 15.32, Silas was a leader of the church and a prophet. Okay, so that's Silas that Paul is traveling with. And though the letters are sent in the name of all three men, you see that all three of them appear in the salutation, the use of the first person singular, I, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 5, and in 527, indicates that one of the three is the principal author. Okay, one of them is the principal author, and 1 Thessalonians 2.18 indicates that that principal author is Paul, as does his appearing first in the listing in the salutation. Okay, so they're all involved in it, but Paul is the principal author of the letter. So sometimes I'll refer to them as the missionaries, all three of them. Sometimes I'll just say Paul says, okay, but you understand uh, the setting and what's going on. Now, the letter, as I say, they're sent in the name of all three men, but Paul's the prime, prime person. Now, the city of Thessalonica. What, do we know anything about Thessalonica? We do. And in A.D. 44, so Paul's writing from Corinth around A.D. 50. In A.D. 44, Thessalonica, from that date, that year, Thessalonica served as the capital of Macedonia. It was the largest and most important city in the province of Macedonia, being its chief port city, you see here, oh, hit the wrong button, somebody help me, all right, here we go, let me hit this guy, I don't know if you can see, there's Thessalonica, you see it's right on this bay or whatever, it's, it was the chief port city, and it's also located right on what's called the Via Ignatia, which was the main Roman east-west road. Okay, they had roads. And they had, this was like the highway. And so it's there. And it's also had a major northern route that went north from the port along the Axius River. So it had, you have a significant north-south route. It's on the Via Ignatia, which is the main, and it's the principal port city. So it is a, it's a significant city in the Roman province and it was a free city meaning that the local inhabitants they had their own government they had their own rights of citizenship and it was very cosmopolitan we might use the word diverse it had Greeks Romans and it also had a significant number of Jews and in keeping with the religious pluralism of major cities in the ancient world, the inhabitants of Thessalonica, they worshipped a multitude of pagan gods. Jeffrey Wyma, in his commentary, uh, did I get, there we go, I didn't go back far enough. All right, Jeffrey Wyma, in his commentary, he says, numismatic coins, right, numismatic, inscriptional, 
and other archaeological evidence reveal that over 25 gods, heroes, and personifications of virtues were worshipped in Thessalonica. In these diverse sources, the specific gods mentioned most frequently include Dionysus, the gods of Egypt, especially Serapis and Isis, but also Osiris, Harpocrates, and Anubis, and Cabiris, who served as the patron deity of Thessalonica. Also important in Thessalonica was the imperial cult, the worship of Roma as a personification of the Roman state and of individual emperors as gods. Other less commonly attested deities include Zeus Hypsistos, the Most High Zeus, Hera, Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Aphrodite, Epituxidia, the Aphrodite giving success, Demeter and her daughter Persephone, Hermes Cardus, the profitable Hermes, Poseidon con connected with the important harbor at Thessalonica, Sibylle, the Phry Phrygian mother goddess, Asclepius, god of healing, and his daughter Hygie Hygieia, health, Nike victory, and Dioscuri, Heracles, Tyche, and Nemesis. Judaism, with the likely presence of a local synagogue, should also be added to this religious potpourri. So I want you to get a sense of the city here. It's a, it's a, and the environment where Paul comes in and the call of Paul is going to be, you do away with all of those things. You see, wait, 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 I, no, 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 I'm going to add Christ. No, no, no. There will be no adding of Christ. Now, I'll talk about this later when we get into the text, but I want you to think about this in terms of real people living real lives in a real culture with family members and friends that is so polytheistic. And here comes this message, and the choice is accept this message and reject all that your culture around you embraces or reject the message. Accept it or reject it. But you can't wind up turning it into something that it's not. Now, the Thessalonian church, Acts 17, 4, it indicates that, that Paul's initial evangelistic effort in the Jewish synagogue, it succeeded in persuading only some Jews. Okay, so that sounds like you're not getting very many of the Jews, but it bore fruit with a large number of devout Greeks. Okay, meaning God-fearers. Gentiles who to varying degrees had associated or aligned with Judaism without converting to Judaism. And as Gene Green says in this, this uh, slide I keep wanting to show you, he says, the God-fearers were, um, were a rather amorphous group. You see, um, fluid boundaries kind of thing, were a rather amorphous group, some of whom had abandoned their gods, but others who had simply added the Jewish God to their pantheon. So the fact they were God-fearers or devout Greeks who in some sense associated with the synagogue and Judaism does not mean that they had to have abandoned their worship of idols. You see, some of them may have, but that wasn't a prerequisite for being in that category. And in Acts 17, 4, it indicates that Paul also converted quite a few prominent women in the city. Now, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, Paul refers to them, the Thessalonians, as those who had turned to God from idols to serve the true and living God, or the living and true God. Now, that suggests that a large majority of the Thessalonian Christians were Gentiles who had been practicing idol worship. That's how he characterizes them. Could there have been some Jews there? Maybe. Yes. We know some were converted. But largely, so that he can characterize them that way, they had turned from practicing idol worship. That probably includes those who converted from full paganism after Paul had spent his three Sabbaths in the synagogue. He's going out then and he's going after full-on pagans, but it would also include those who were devout Greeks, God-fears, 
who were still idol practicers. So he refers to them that way, is that they, they are Gentiles who had turned from idol worship. Now, to the extent it suggests that they were converts from full paganism, well, that's just another indication that Paul quite, uh, quite probably spent more than three weeks there because he has a large number of people that he's converted from just a, from a pagan background. Now, the Thessalonian church, it's very young. And Paul and his companions, they, had, they hadn't had much time to ground them, even if they're there for a couple of months. Hadn't had much time to ground them before they got chased out. And that coupled with the, the polytheism, which is everywhere. They, they're swimming in an ocean of polytheism, and, and the, it's the culture. So you have that, that polytheism, and the hostility of the larger community to the Christian message. You saw what happened. So that, those things, it made their situation precarious, and that's why Paul is so concerned. You can understand why he was so grateful, so thankful. To receive good news because he didn't know what happened to them. What's going to come of them? Are they going to stand? Are they going to honor Jesus? Or are they going to fold and you're going to go back there and everybody's going to just turn from you and not even talk to you? And so here comes Timothy. And he gives that report. And Paul is very thankful for the news he receives. He opens the letter. He says, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. As I said, you, you see all three of them listed here in the salutation, but Paul appears to be the main author. And it's to the group of Christians in Thessalonica, the church that they had planted not many months before. And I've said before, to me, an epiphany, when I was a new Christian, I came out of a worldly background, knew nothing about the Bible, and when I understood... That, oh, I get it. So when you're telling me Colossians, as I say, it sounded like something from Star Trek, you know, from the planet Colossae or something. You know, but once I understood these were locations and what I was reading was letters, it gave me a context to help me get into what is being, how to understand this. And so he's writing to these Christians that they had this church they had planted not many months before, and they are in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, in that their union with the Father is because of their union with Jesus. Paul is here telling people about Jesus. He's preaching the gospel of Christ. He's letting them know what God has done in Christ. And so they are in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ because their union with the Father derives from their union with Christ. As the Apostle John put it much later in 1 John chapter 2, verse 23, no one who denies the Son has the Father. I know that's popular in our world and culture. No, 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 no. I got a great relationship with God, but I don't know. Nope. <laughs> you see, no one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. Okay, so this is what Paul, this is all wrapped up in here. When Paul says to them, he says they're in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul's greeting is for God's grace in Christ to be upon them. And for them to have peace, to have harmony and fellowship with God that results from the bestowal of that grace. That's how Paul opens. Now, there's an additional phrase in the King James that says, from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ after this, and that's not reproduced in, in most English translations because it's, it's almost certainly not original. Okay, so that's if, if, if you have that and you wonder why it's not here, that's why. Now, Paul, he begins here in 1 Thessalonians 1. See, these letters are so short, unlike the Gospel of Mark, I can read the text, and I like doing that. He says, we always give thanks to God. Now think of these Thessalonians who have had this. They've been converted. They have been living for Jesus. They're under great pressure. Now Timothy has come to them. They tell Timothy, he goes back. Now here at some point comes a letter from Paul. And this letter is being read 
in the gathering. And he says, we always give thanks to God for all of you when making mention of you in our prayers. When we pray and mention you, we always give thanks for you. Oh man, I like it. You see, he says, recalling constantly in the presence of our God and Father, meaning when praying, recalling constantly in the presence of our God and Father, your work of faith and labor of love and perseverance of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Knowing, brothers loved by God, your election, that our gospel did not come to you in word alone, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with much certainty, even as you know the sort of men we were among you for your sakes. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord by receiving the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, with the result that you became an example for all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has been sounded forth from you, not only into Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth into every place, so that we do not need to say anything about it. For they themselves announce about us what sort of visit we had to you. How you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Now Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they tell the Thessalonians that when they mention them in their prayers, they regularly give thanks for all of them. And they tell them, they tell them that to encourage them. They want them to know. They want them to know that they're doing well in the faith. That they're pleasing not only the missionaries, but they're pleasing God. They want to encourage them that way. And the reason they always give thanks to God for all of them is that they recall regularly in their prayers, in the presence of our God and Father, the Thessalonians' work of faith, labor of love, and perseverance of hope in Jesus Christ. They're thankful because the Thessalonians, they demonstrated the presence of genuine faith, love, and hope. Those attitudes and those qualities bubbled out in their actions, just overflowed and bubbled out in their actions in their work and labor and in their perseverance in the face of persecution. As the New International Version renders the clause, it says, your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, it is a wonderful thing to see people to whom you've preached, people you have taught. It is a wonderful thing to see them giving themselves over to the Lord Jesus Christ, living like they get it. Conversely, it's a horrible thing to have taught people and to have celebrated with them and to rejoice and sung songs with them and then to hear or to see that they no longer honor and love and uh, treat Jesus the way he should be treated. So Paul hears how they are living like they get it. And if you've taught anybody about Jesus, you know what I'm talking about. You know what a joy that is to hear somebody that you haven't talked to in a long time and somebody will tell you, oh yeah, he's doing great. He's serving faithfully, serves as an elder here, does this, does that. It's just a wonderful thing. Now the reason, you see, they're living like they're getting now, even more fundamentally, he says that they always give thanks for them because they know their election. You see, they're having been chosen by God to receive great blessings. 
Now, I heard that bell, so I know I'm going to get interrupted here, and that's just the way it goes. But Calvinists, okay, Calvinists who, uh, that theological position, they make up a significant part of what is known as evangelicalism. But Calvinists, they, they believe that God from eternity, that he chose certain specific individuals to be saved, and that he did so unconditionally. In other words, he did so, he picked them without regard to anything in or about them. And having chosen them, he then guaranteed their salvation by making them believe, determining they would believe, by calling them in their terminology irresistibly. So he determines certain people unconditionally, based on nothing in them or about them, that they will be saved. And then he guarantees their faith by calling them irresistibly and making it impossible for them to fall away. So all those that God did not choose from eternity, they are damned necessarily. Because God will not enable them to believe and it is impossible for them to believe without that enablement. Now, that's the Calvinist take on election predestination in a nutshell. I mean, books and books are written on this kind of thing. All right, now, another significant, the two most significant views within Protestantism of this. You have the Calvinist view, and then you have what's called the Arminian view. Are there other views? There are. But these two by far dominate the uh, theological landscape of Protestantism and Arminians, which includes most people in churches rooted in the American Restoration Movement. They probably don't know that. But it includes most people in churches rooted in the American Restoration Movement like Churches of Christ. Let me just finish this and, and I'll shut up. Okay, and it also includes Baptist, Wesleyans, uh, Methodists, Pentecostal groups, and I can't tell you what they believe until I see you again. <laughs> Thanks for coming.